All right. Good morning, everybody. So this will be a uh, very short kind of summary of different principles of surgical resection for GISTs. It's by no means comprehensive because I think everybody has to have a surgical plan that's tailored specifically to their situation. Um, but in order to go over some of these principles, we'll start just with uh, one question a lot of people have is about surgical approach as far as an open surgery versus laparoscopic or robotic to be minimally invasive. Um, and I think that approach can always be considered for patients. Um, there's no hard and fast rules about it. There's been some literature about guidelines for who would be more likely a candidate for a minimally invasive approach to try and minimize conversion rates uh, and succeed at continuing with minimally invasive um, surgery. I think some things that I keep in mind are that uh, patients who are probably more amenable to this would be those who don't have second primaries or multifocal disease or any evidence of spread outside of the stomach itself uh, or the small bowel, if that's where the primary is, for example. Uh, tumors that are less than or up to five centimeters in diameter, just because extraction is uh, from the abdominal cavity is one of the considerations as well. So if you're already going to make a decent sized incision just to remove the tumor, then maybe just going through an open approach is going to be more reasonable. And I think it's location specifically for the stomach um, as far as it's more favorable where it's in the body of the stomach or along the greater curvature, uh, just because it's more easily accessible as opposed to closer to the um, esophagus or closer to the um, pylorus. So when we look at the actual resection itself, another consideration is margins. And this is where we as surgeons can directly impact outcomes. Um, and our goal, I would say, should always be for a negative or what's called an R0 resection, um, meaning that there's no evidence of tumor where we've cut uh, the stomach or small bowel or the organ where this is originating from. Uh, for folks who do end up having a microscopically positive or R1 resection, it is associated with decreased recurrence-free survival. Um, However, some of that can be negated with systemic agents. And so when we look at historical data for patients with uh, kit mutant, just those who ended up going on adjuvant imatinib after surgery had a uh, similar recurrence free survival uh, when they had an R0 resection versus an R1 resection. So in the setting of effective systemic agents, we can make up for that positive microscopic margin. Um, but of course, for folks who don't have reliable systemic agents available and an indication for what we call adjuvant treatment, meaning giving medications in the absence of evidence of disease, then we can't make up for that gap. Um, even with the uh, decreased recurrence-free survival with a positive margin and it's similar overall survival. And so that's also an important point to make that we're really saying that the only survival that's significantly impacted is that of the disease itself. Um, and there is no clear benefit that's been demonstrated in the literature to say that going back and cutting that organ again in order to get a negative margin is truly beneficial because again, our our primary outcome, what we're trying to achieve for folks is overall survival. And so we're not gonna move that needle by doing another surgery. Looking at extent of surgery, uh, a lot of times this is really dictated by the anatomy. So where is the tumor in relation to different components of the stomach or the small bowel or the organ of origin? Um, and so if it's uh, something that's close to the pylorus, then most likely a distal gastrectomy is gonna be required as opposed to a partial gastrectomy. Uh, and if it's close to the esophagus, then sometimes a total gastrectomy is required. There's evidence out of Asia about describing a proximal gastrectomy uh, and then reconnecting the distal stomach to the esophagus. But the function of that is poor because we've cut across the vagus nerve. And so it's kind of, um, doesn't have the same sort of tone and ability to empty uh, what we eat and drink uh, in the same way as when the proximal portion or the upper portion of the stomach is maintained. Um, and when we think about wild type just uh, patients, then we also think that, uh, or what we see is that multifocality is more likely to occur. And so we always are concerned about second primaries in folks who have SDH deficiency um, in particular, in that we can often find multiple tumors within the wall of the stomach. And so, uh, sometimes the 
the rationale is to remove just the symptomatic tumor that's either obstructive or bleeding or causing pain and leave smaller ones behind. Mm -hmm. The argument could also be made that, well, if those are someday going to develop into symptomatic tumors, if we're already doing a surgery and a distal gastrectomy, we'll be able to remove all of those. That may also be reasonable. Uh, and that's where there's that possible role of risk reduction. And so this was a paper by Dr. Cyclic um, as primary author looking at uh, uh, wild type, uh, just patients from different institutions and seeing and noticing that SDH deficient gists were primarily located in the body and the antrum or the distal part of the stomach. And they were much less frequently associated in the proximal portion. And we contributed in this, looking at the National Cancer Database for patients who are uh, diagnosed with gastrointestinal stromal tumors across the country, identifying those who were KIT and PDGFRA wild type, uh, and looking at where were these tumors located in the stomach. And I think this is still exploratory in nature. So I'm not saying that we would recommend distal gastrectomies as a matter of routine for patients with SDH deficiency, but uh, certainly in the setting of multifocality, there may be more rationale for that as opposed to wedge gastrectomies or partial gastrectomies. Um, another important aspect from surgery is handling of the specimen. And what we really would uh, always try to do is avoid rupture. Uh, even in folks who do have involvement on the peritoneal surfaces, which is not infrequent, that is, I would say, a different scenario than somebody who has free rupture of tumor throughout the abdominal cavity. And, and when we look at, for example, comparing the outcomes in patients who have a positive margin versus patients who have had intraoperative tumor rupture, folks who unfortunately experience that tumor rupture will have worse outcomes. And so ways to try and avoid that are to take advantage of the pseudocapsule that tends to surround just, just push as opposed to invade like other types of uh, malignancies. And we can preserve that pseudocapsule. And what we also will try to do is handle the tissues around the tumor as opposed to handling the tumor itself with instruments or our hands. Um, and of course, we also avoid morselating or um, basically breaking up the tumor in order to facilitate removing it through a smaller incision. I think if the incision needs to be made a little bit larger so it comes out intact, that helps as far as preventing spread, it helps as far as margin analysis, and I think it's just in the best interest of the patient. And then one question is the role of lymphadenectomy or removal of lymph nodes. Um, lymph node involvement is very uncommon in non-wild type gastrointestinal stromal tumor. It is rather common compared to that in wild type. Um, and it's rare to occur, but has happened outside of the pelvis. So sometimes uh, patients have developed uh, axillary lymph node metastases from GIST or inguinal lymph node metastases. So it can happen. Um, but I think the principle is, is that of selective lymph node resection. So we don't go in and remove all of the regional lymph nodes in that area, partially because we want to maintain the blood supply to the stomach and therefore keep it alive. But if we do have radiographically apparent lymph nodes, then we do want to remove those. So in this example on the top is a recurrence of just that's actually on the omentum behind the stomach and peeled away. And so that was a peritoneal metastasis. And down on the lower one, is a lymph node that's within the lesser curve of the stomach that was selectively removed and was indeed positive uh, for gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Um, just very briefly, when we look at prognosis and when we look at GIST, we look at location, we look at size, and we look at the tumor grading or the mitotic rate. And so what mitoses or mitotic um, figures will look like are these areas that have been highlighted in these two histologic slides where you can see these cells are in active mitosis and therefore they are uh, proliferating. And so when we look at, sorry, if anybody was taking a picture there. Um, <laughs> and so when we look at the prognosis for patients, this is primarily based off of uh, patients with KIT or PDGR for a mutant just, um, when we have low grade tumors or fewer than, or up to five mitoses per 50 high powered fields, uh, and small size in the stomach, then we see a low risk of recurrence overall uh, as the tumor is larger or particularly as the mitotic rate goes up. And I would consider it to be a continuous variable, right? Somebody who has eight mitoses versus somebody who has 50 mitoses, 
those are different diseases, even though the cutoffs are um, maybe different as far as saying five mitosis per 50 high power fields or 10. Um, and also it's a higher risk when it's outside of the stomach. So if it's in the small intestine or when we have colorectal gists or esophageal gists, those are going to be higher risk for recurrence. So again, these are very um, kind of broad strokes considerations for, for surgery basics and